There is a darkness in humanity that has manifested itself in a lust for blood throughout the ages. The Old Testament and ancient myths catalog murder and revenge as part of the fabric of life in ancient times. Cain slew Abel. Romulus slew Remus. Unleashing the beast within is a possibility for all of us. The decision to kill from passion or premeditation has often defined our world, past, present, and future. Wars have terrorized entire populations for thousands of years. The American West was home to ruthless killers who were idolized in fiction and folklore. Evil evolved to a hideous new form with the genocidal dictators of the 20th century, such as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, who ordered the death of tens of millions. But in the middle of the 20th century, a new and chilling phenomenon emerged in post-war Western society, the serial killer. As if fashioned from our nightmares, they terrify and fascinate us. Lurking behind masks of bland normality, they often evade capture for years, decades, or eternity. They are America's serial killers. We killed her. We dumped her body off, and that was it. Nothing to it. Every year in this country, we have about 20 serial killers, 10 of whom are apprehended, 10 of whom are on the loose. And they are, in total, responsible for some 200 deaths. So 200 victims of serial killers on a yearly basis. And what makes this particularly important for us is that the average serial killer is responsible for 10 deaths. That's a huge body count. America's serial killers, Portraits and Evil, will strip the covers from a world of profiling and forensic science as we expose America's most brutal serial killers. The first sensational serial killer was Britain's Jack the Ripper. But the serial killer phenomenon would soon shift to America. Indeed, in 1888, even as the Ripper was gutting his prostitute victims and terrorizing London, two of the most prolific serial killers the world would ever see were already hard at work practicing their ghoulish trade in the United States. Only the country didn't know it. One was Dr. H. H. Holmes, who told the detectives who finally caught up with him, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. No more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world and he has been with me since. The other early American serial killer was Jane Topan. With a chilling smile, she confessed to 31 murders, stating, that is my ambition, to have killed more people, more helpless people, than any man or woman who has ever lived. Both of these killers murdered without conscience. It has to do with a lack of normal guilt feelings associated with harming other individuals. Um, if you are able to 
uh, hurt somebody or kill somebody without conscience, uh, then I think that applies to the sociopathic personality. Most serial killers are not insane in either a legal or a psychiatric sense. Uh, they generally don't hallucinate. They don't hear voices in an empty room. They don't talk to dogs. They don't suffer from a profound thought disorder. Most of them know the difference between right and wrong. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they choose to do it because it makes them feel so good, because it gives them that sense of superiority that they crave. Most of them are sociopaths uh, or psychopaths, if you prefer. They, they have a, a disorder of character and personality uh, that doesn't qualify for the insanity defense, but they lack a conscience. They lack what Sigmund Freud called a superego. They don't feel remorseful when they do the wrong thing. Uh, they lack any feelings of empathy toward the pain and suffering of their victims. So they are able to kill and torture with moral impunity. They're manipulative. They're more crafty than they are crazy. And their crimes are sickening, but they're really not sick. They're more bad than they are mad. The reason, at the end of the 19th century, why America would become a center of serial killers in the next century is a hotly debated issue. For most of the 19th century, America had been an agricultural paradise. Plenty of land and a frontier that opened out onto even more land for settlers pushing westward. The country was an idyllic place where people were connected to the land, their families, and their communities. Help and friendship were the next farm over or in the small town where families brought their produce to sell and in turn bought goods. But by the turn of the 20th century, the frontier was gone and the country had filled out from coast to coast. America was a country that was moving from a rural to an urban society. The promise of paradise had vanished replaced by the dark face of industry and large, uncaring cities. Hundreds of thousands of younger sons and daughters poured into its swelling cities. Here, they competed with the millions of European immigrants for work. More often than not, these newcomers to the city ended up in low-paying jobs, scraping by. I think the evolution of large urban complex societies can sometimes provide the incubator for murder in the sense that we often know less about each other. There's more anonymity. And people who murder can sometimes go undetected because there isn't that kind of small town quality where everybody knows everyone else. There's more camouflage. There's more anonymity. We have no monopoly of serial murder in the United States, but we've kind of cornered the market. Uh, it isn't poverty that breeds serial killing. Uh, it is a breakdown in community. If you look carefully at where most of the serial killings have occurred, they're in places where there are lots of strangers, where there's no sense of community, where hundreds of thousands of people have relocated for the sake of a job, uh, as a new beginning or maybe a last resort. And when they arrive in California or Alaska or New York State or Illinois or Florida or Texas, uh, they have no support systems. They don't have their friends and family to get them through tough times. They have nobody around who says, look, Jimmy, you can make it. We'll help you get another job. We'll encourage you. We'll support you. Wherever you find lots of strangers, you find lots of serial murder.
While Jack the Ripper killed perhaps as many as 11 people, H.H. H. Holmes confessed to killing hundreds. When he was finally caught, newspapers declared him the Archfiend, the Devil Incarnate. But Holmes appeared to be anything but the Devil. He was a handsome man in his 20s, a ladies' man, a bit of a dandy, and a shrewd businessman. But he was also a compulsive con artist and the most efficient of all the serial killers past and present. And the most enigmatic of all the serial killers. Holding a medical degree from the University of Michigan, he was, in many ways, the archetypical mad doctor. Similar to the serial killer in the 1932 movie thriller, Dr. X. Here we see the serial killer. Dr. X is a white male in his early 30s. Of mine. May we come in? Of course, of course, gentlemen. Come in. Come Intelligent. Forward. Clever. This is Mr. Stevens, Mr. And like the real-life H.H. H. Holmes, he is a doctor. He loves the macabre and is particularly fascinated with human body parts. That's a heart. I've kept it alive for three years by electrolysis. Electrolysis. Professor Wells has accomplished some remarkable findings in nerve reflexes. You flatter me, Doctor. Oh, no, no. I understand, Professor, that you live just for your work, that you seldom leave the Institute. Not necessarily. I played truant a short while ago. I was down by the waterfront for a breath of air. What time? Was you're, that? you're not feeling well? Your arm is troubling you? Yes, it's, it's very annoying. Well, you're foolish to sit there in discomfort. If you gentlemen don't mind, I... Why, of course not, of course not. I put it on just as I heard you coming. An empty sleeve is refolding to most people. <laughs> well, I, I think we've taken up enough of Professor Wells' time. Oh, not at all, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, Professor. Well, gentlemen, shall we be going? <laughs> no one could have predicted the bizarre and gruesome turn H.H. H. Holmes' life would take from his birth. He was born into a wealthy, and respected New Hampshire family, and given the name Herman Webster Mudgett. But as a young boy, he was constantly bullied. And then came a day when the bullying went too far. His taunters took him to a doctor's office. There, they put the lifeless bony fingers of a human skeleton upon his face. Far from being horrified, Herman found the experience fascinating, even thrilling. There, his ghoulish interest in human anatomy was born. Herman began by dissecting kittens, dogs, rabbits, any animal he could find. There are a number of cases involving serial murderers where if you drill deep and look at their own personal histories, what you find is that they themselves have been victims of abuse, sometimes torture, as children. And one of the consequences of that abuse is ultimately the murder of another person. But in between, one often finds evidence of a child who's been a victim of abuse, who for a number of years tortures animals as a way to deal with their own victimization. And the torturing of animals can sometimes evolve over time into the torture, abuse, and ultimately murder of another human being. It is very common to find that perpetrators of serial murder themselves were subjected to horrific abuse as children. I recently studied the biographies of 54 serial killers and uh, I looked uh, in their life stories for episodes of animal abuse uh, and I think it's uh, not surprising that most of them had abused animals when they were children. Of course, so have millions of healthy, decent people. They grow up and out of it. You know, animal abuse when you're six or seven years old is certainly a symptom 
of powerlessness. But there are many people who grow out of that feeling. Serial killers, for some reason, can't do that. And they don't just abuse animals. Oh, no. Most of them abuse in the cruelest possible manner. Dogs and cats, they maximize the suffering. They do it with their own hands by stabbing and mutilating and dismembering and, and, and strangling to death uh, domesticated uh, animals, usually family pets. Indeed, many serial killers rehearse. Uh, when they're children, they, they will use a particular method uh, to abuse animals and inflict cruelty and punishment and pain and suffering. And then they use the same method decades later on their human victims. If, if, they, if they, they practice bestiality when there's young children, they rape their human victims later. If they stab or strangle the animals, they stab or strangle human beings. So it's a way of rehearsing. It's a way of providing a training ground for these serial killers. At the age of 18, Herman married Clara Levering, the daughter of a rich local farmer. One year later, Herman left rural New Hampshire to attend the University of Michigan Medical School. There, he saw opportunities in the hospital wards and dissection rooms to gain access to corpses for his insurance scams. It was here he gave himself his own nickname, Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, H.H. H. Holmes. His insurance scams were brilliant. Holmes stole cadavers from medical laboratories, disfigured them, planted them where they would be found as accidents, and then claimed they were relatives of the one and only H. H. Holmes. Having previously taken out insurance policies on these fictitious family members, he collected a tidy sum, one in excess of $12,000. At this point, it was fortunate for Clara that she and her infant son returned to New Hampshire and never saw Holmes again. Just as suddenly, Holmes dropped out of sight. He turned up briefly in St. Paul and New York. Then in 1885, at the age of 25, posing as an inventor, Holmes resurfaced in Chicago's north suburban town of Wilmette. Though he had not divorced his first wife, he was now married to Myrtle Z. Belknap, the daughter of a wealthy businessman, a man Holmes had unsuccessfully tried to swindle and kill. It is unknown how many people Holmes may have killed between Michigan and Chicago. Maybe none. Maybe many. Well, I think the likelihood of, of Holmes having murdered additional people between his college experience and the beginning of his activities surrounding the World's Fair in Chicago, I think is very high. Um, you know, we're talking about a person who by the time he came to Chicago had an elaborate fantasy that he was able to execute in an incredibly complicated and full-blown fashion. Uh, it strikes me that that kind of fantasy um, and the ability to execute that fantasy um, probably didn't spring into being all complete in Chicago. I think that there's pro it's probably very likely that he had additional experiences um, with murder in between college and the time he came to Chicago. Holmes' first known killing was a Mrs. E.S. Holton. In 1887, H.H. H. Holmes began working as an assistant at a local drugstore in Chicago, run by Mrs. E.S. Holton. An older woman who could not handle the trade any longer, she needed assistance. 
It was not long before Holmes seemed to be more the manager of the store and less the prescription clerk. In 1887, Mrs. E.S. Holton vanished without a trace. A short time after, Holmes announced that he had purchased the store from the widow just prior to her, quote, moving out west, close quote. Now Holmes had a fabulous source of income. Then, at the age of 29, H.H. H. Holmes was about to blossom into America's most prolific and fiendish serial killer. Wealthy beyond his wildest dreams, Holmes concocted a killing scheme that would change the face of horror forever. He bought a lot across from his drugstore and built what has become known as the Castle of Horrors, also known as the Murder Castle. Since then, the House of Horrors has become a part of the American popular culture, particularly in movies and at Halloween. Cunning as well as murderous, Holmes designed his three-story House of Horrors to appear from the outside like any ordinary commercial building. Shops and his new drugstore occupied the bottom floor. But the upper two floors were a bizarre maze of torture rooms and execution chambers. Many of the rooms were windowless, with doors that could only be opened from the outside. Some rooms, outfitted with gas lines, allowed Holmes to hear the screams of his victims as they suffocated. It was a strange building with halls at odd angles and stairways that went nowhere. But the most ghoulish construction was the basement. Here was a dissecting room for stripping the flesh of his victims and making skeletons for medical schools. It also held two giant furnaces for cremating bodies. Holmes' House of Horrors would later become a staple of Hollywood. In fact, Dr. X, the first American movie to grapple with the theme of the serial killer, capitalized on the idea of the murder house with its mad doctor laboratories. The film even recreated Holmes' gas chamber. In the early 30s, psychologists were just coming to grips with the idea of a hidden dark side of the human subconscious. Replacing the idea of devil possession, it was the subconscious where unknown factors dwelled. Deep, dark structures that could drive people to all manner of hideous acts, including murder. In this otherwise B-horror movie, one scene stands out as a serious attempt to explain the phenomena of the serial killer. Your heartbeats are being reflected before you. Doctor, I protest! As the heart beats faster and faster, so does that red liquid begin to pulse and rise until terror takes hold of the subject and the liquid rises to the very top of the tube. He whose tube does that is the guilty man. Here are a line of wax figures. It is the idea that hidden deep in the subconscious are triggers. Triggers such as the presence of a prostitute. First, a woman of the streets, killed in the tenement district. 
a body found late at night in a gutter. The next victim, a middle-aged woman, killed just before dawn as she was on her way to market, a bleeding body found under a dock by the waterfront. Then a dope fiend, strangled and mutilated in the doorway of a dance hall. Next, a beautiful young girl, violently killed as she lay on a hospital bed, recovering from an illness. Or the folklore trigger of a full moon overcoming a person and unleashing a murderous obsession that must be carried through to completion. You're about to see reenacted the murder of the killer's latest victim, an old scrub woman. She's coming home from work. It's late. A full moon shines down upon her. She's passing through an alleyway when suddenly a terrible figure steals out. He starts creeping towards her. As old Annie stoops to pick up a newspaper, the figure suddenly takes her throat in his powerful hand. If you look at how people's attitudes changed towards these kinds of criminal acts, I think there was probably a time when people really believed that humans weren't capable of doing things like this. And that, that very well may be behind the legends of vampires or werewolves, some desire to sort of make what these people did otherworldly, because that was a way they could explain away the actions, right? No real person would do that, but a person who was a werewolf would when the moon was full because to lose their humanity, right? Or a vampire who you know, had, had this sort of mythological... Um, function that, that was uh, gaining eternal life through the killing of humans. You know, what it does is it, it takes that person and makes them less human. One of the scariest aspects of talking about serial killers is to think that their behavior is very human. To me, suggesting that there's one simple explanation that the moon was in this position and um, uh, some sort of werewolf related explanation is just too simplistic and frankly naive. By 1892, Holmes' murder castle was complete. America's greatest serial killing spree was about to commence. At first, he advertised lodging to attract victims. Next, he put ads in small town newspapers promising employment, particularly for young women. When they arrived, he took their money and they disappeared. But this was simply a lead up to the stream of visitors arriving for the great Chicago World's Fair in 1893. The fair was a monument to architecture and the arts. But at the same time, it highlighted firsts that were to become the hallmark of the United States industry and production. Easily prepared breakfast foods, including Aunt Jemima pancake mix, Quaker Oats and Cream of Wheat debuted at the World's Fair. But the highlight of the fair's firsts was the dazzling technological breakthrough by Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse when they introduced the entire country to electrical power by lighting up the World's Fair. But with all the innovation, there also came a darker side to the fair's firsts. Murder, murder most foul, murder without remorse. Next to the fair stood H. H. Holmes' House of Horrors, the first building ever constructed for the sole purpose of serial killing. For six months, a reeling mass of humanity jammed the fairgrounds. Thousands of these carefree fairgoers would go missing. How many fell prey to Holmes' House of Horrors will never truly be known. 
my understanding is that there was, he had the ability within his hotel to put a number of individuals in the same room and then deprive them of oxygen, and he was able to listen to them as they died. Now that's sort of, that's a step away from, say, the enjoyment of killing someone face to face, right? In other words, he wasn't stabbing them, he wasn't doing any of that. He was listening to them experience death. That came later. You know, the, his, his initial forays into crime, uh, money-making schemes, con schemes, um, obviously predated the murder, but once he'd killed a few times, he apparently developed a taste for it. That hotel, while it was to a certain degree a money-making thing, I mean, he ran it as a hotel, there were people that checked in, he obviously got money from them, but there was a lot of money spent on pursuing his fantasy or his, his murder life, if you will. Um, uh, it's pretty interesting that he would use another kind of criminal behavior to essentially fund a non-profit making aspect of his criminal behavior, which was killing people for fun. Holmes might never have been caught, except for his own greed. When the Chicago Fair closed in October of 1893, Holmes decided to leave the Windy City. But before he left, he teamed up with two other con men, Benjamin Peitzel and Marion Hedgepeth, for one more scam, this time in Philadelphia. The three of them agreed to fake Peitzel's death in a laboratory explosion and substitute a cadaver. They would then split the $10,000 life insurance policy on Peitzel three ways. But Holmes' greed led him to kill Peitzel for real. Then Holmes reneged on Hedgepeth's share and ran off with the money and three of Peitzel's five children, Howard, Alice, and Nellie Peitzel. Incensed that he hadn't gotten his share, Marion Hedgepeth ratted him out. Holmes was eventually tracked down by Philadelphia detective Frank Geyer in 1894. Geyer was the first of the serial killer detectives. Detectives who through sheer determination and dogged police work would bring these hell fiends to justice. Sadly, Geyer was too late to save the children. Holmes had already murdered them. The Philadelphia prosecutors tried and convicted Holmes for Benjamin Peitzel's murder and the brutal killing of the three children. But the full depth of Holmes' depravity lay back in Chicago. There, police, alerted by the insurance underwriter for the Peitzel claim, raided Holmes' murder castle. What they found turned the stomachs of even the most hardened of Chicago's cops. Strong men who had lived through the Chicago fire that killed thousands. The mansion contained rooms for torture and gas chambers. The stove in his office held a rib bone and hair of a woman. But the real horror was in the basement. Here, police uncovered a macabre disassembly plant for human bodies. It was here that Holmes dissected his victims, stripped the flesh with powerful acids, and then sold their skeletons to medical schools across the country. Those he didn't dissect were burned in two furnaces that he had specially constructed for that purpose or they were cast into lime pits. The total number of victims will never be known. But evidence pointed to hundreds murdered. Confronted by the proof of his horrific crimes, Holmes admitted to hundreds of killings while in Chicago. He described his acts of murder methodically, without conscience the way a man would describe butchering cattle. Indeed, 
Throughout his confession, Holmes, America's first and most accomplished serial killer, sat stone-faced as he recited ghoulish details of the slaughter. Indeed, as many future serial killers would do when they were caught. There's a couple things that I find really most interesting about Holmes. Number one is that he was a criminal in the larger sense. In other words, a lot of his murders were associated with insurance scams. He was a, he was a guy who was after the buck. But somewhere along the way, associated with his, what we would call more typical or normal criminal activity, he came to be fascinated with death, and he pursued that to a degree of elaboration that I can't say we can attribute to any other serial killer. He built a castle, essentially, uh, a hotel, which was devoted from the beginning, prior to construction, to the killing of human beings and to his ability to enjoy and experience in many different ways the killing of human beings. That's unique. This wasn't just a person who killed once or twice or even a number of times. This is a person who built up an elaborate physical building that sole purpose was to allow him to kill people in the most elaborate ways to listen to their cries of pain, and then to dispose of the bodies so that he wouldn't be caught. The elaboration of that fantasy um, required as its first step a lack of conscience. For Holmes, killing was part of his compulsive crime business. But it was also a business for which he had no scruples. A business for which he had no conscience showed no remorse. H. H. Holmes was put to death in 1896 by hanging. It took him 15 minutes to strangle to death, shorter than many of the tortures his victims endured in his house of horrors. As for Chicago's castle of death with its grisly evidence of murder, it burned to the ground in 1895 but was forever embedded in the American popular culture as the archetypal house of death and torture. Unlike Holmes, who murdered for profit, Jane Topin, America's most prolific female serial killer, killed just to see the life drain out of her victim's eyes. When finally caught in 1901, appalled detectives and doctors were terrified by their own conclusion. Jane Topin was the proverbial bad seed, descended from a lineage of evil, handed down from father to son, mother to daughter. Killers, who, in the 19th century's way of understanding, were born bad born with the seed of evil in them. The concept of the bad seed, the concept of the serial killer having these kind of inborn instincts that compels them to kill, um, I think is largely myth. I'm willing to believe that there are people who, at the time of birth, may have a predisposition toward mental illness that may ultimately um, compel them to kill. You know, there are a number of serial killers who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Well, schizophrenia often has biochemical genetic roots that ultimately can manifest themselves in serial killing. But I'm reluctant to use language such as bad seed. I think that is too simplistic and doesn't recognize that often what we're dealing with here is very complex psychiatric disturbance and mental illness. The theme of inherited evil would be brought into the spotlight in the spellbinding 1956 movie, The Bad Seed, based on Topan herself. Like Rhoda, the young girl from the movie, Jane Topan had inherited evil. Her father went insane, and so did an older sister. But unlike Rhoda, Jane's murderous ways did not come to full flower until she entered nursing school in 1885. 
It was here she learned the skills to become an angel of death as she moved effortlessly among the middle and upper classes as a private nurse. Skills she would use to poison 31 people with lethal injections of morphine and atropine, two chemicals that offset the symptoms of each other. There are a number of cases throughout history when serial killers inject people with drugs and kill them, this kind of silent killing. You don't hear gunshots. You don't hear the sounds of strangulation. You don't hear the sounds of stabbings. Most serial killers are men. Uh, and the few serial killers who are women uh, are not sexual sadists for the most part. Uh, there are, however, some women who are medical practitioners, nurses, nurses' aides, who decide to play God uh, with the lives of their patients. They decide who lives and who dies, and it makes them feel powerful. They may not use sex as a vehicle uh, for gaining a sense of control and dominance, but they do it by injecting a lethal dose of morphine, uh, as Topin did, uh, or uh, suffocating their patients with a pillow. Uh, it makes them feel so good. It makes them feel powerful and superior uh, to their poor victims. Uh, and by taking their lives of their patients, uh, they feel godly, and that's why they do it. And when you interview the offender, you get this kind of cool, calm demeanor, suggesting that this individual isn't upset by the killings. And of course, that's deeply disturbing to talk to someone who doesn't seem to be rattled by these remarkably heinous murders. And in my experience, in those cases, often what you're dealing with is somebody who manifests psychopathic qualities, somebody who, as is often the case, has a trauma history, someone who has a history of abuse, someone who is so intensely angry, someone who is rageful toward the world, toward individual people, and will often manifest their rage in killing others and destroying lives. Born a Nora Kelly in 1857, Jane was adopted at age five by a Boston family, the Topans, after her father went insane. Later, one of Jane's sisters was also committed for insanity. Unlike most serial killers, Jane was a bright, cheerful child who learned quickly. At 19, she became betrothed but was jilted at the altar by her fiancé. Strangely uncommunicative and even hostile after that, Jane left home to study nursing. Once more, she excelled in her studies, though supervisors were concerned about her fascination with autopsies. It was also during this time that her personality changed radically becoming like two different people. Known as Jolly Jane to her bosses and clients, she was a teetotaler and jovial, often telling outrageous and amusing stories. But at night, she caroused in bars, drank beer, and denounced everyone at work. Jane passed her nursing exams in 1887 and for the next 14 years, she plied her trade of killing while pretending to be an angel of mercy. She was finally brought to justice in 1901 after she killed off the entire Davis family of Catamet, Massachusetts. At her trial, Jane described how she felt unattached to any of her victims. Yet clearly, she was sexually aroused by the killing. Topan even once described climbing into bed with one of her female victims, caressing and fondling her as she died, and, quote, watched with delight as she gasped her life out, close quote. 
Topan was found not guilty by reason of insanity and spent the rest of her life in a mental hospital. She would taunt the hospital staff. Get some morphine, dearie, and we'll go out in the ward. Then she would add with a chilling smile, you and I will have a lot of fun seeing them die. She died in 1938, the bad seed to the end. The irony of H.H. H. Holmes and Jane Topan is that they killed hundreds more than Jack the Ripper, yet they never terrorized the cities where they lived. In fact, they went out of their way to make certain that their killings never caused headlines. Newspapers blaring front-page stories of cold-blooded murderers loose on big city streets would have been bad for the business of murder. And for both Holmes and Topan, killing people was a business like any other. Mm -hmm.